When hearing the term procedural generation and story-driven in the same sentence, one might be forgiven for rolling their eyes or at least feeling skeptical of the combination. These two elements tend to lead to high amounts of repetition, events that don't coincide with one another, and uninteresting filler to name a few. Simply put, it's difficult to create a cohesive narrative when even the game itself doesn't know what the beginning, middle, or end is going to be. This struggle only gets worse when it has to be applied to not just one individual, but an entire cast of completely generic-looking blank slates. The difficulty becomes turning these inconsequential pieces of paper into people with depth, relationships, and a history that the player is invested in. Alright, so if I'm bothering to make this point, clearly the topic of this video has to relate. So it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that Waldermyth utilizes this method of design. And honestly, for the most part, it does a pretty good job. It's not perfect, mind you, but it manages to mix together what may initially appear to be oil and water quite well. I'm making a big show of this not just for the reason that I think it's impressive, but because it's easily the biggest selling point of this title. Waldermyth is a self-described myth-making tactical RPG. Now I know. My reaction to reading that for the first time was, that's cool and all, but what does that even mean? Tactical RPG I'm familiar with, but myth-making? Never quite heard that one before. What this essentially boils down to is crafting a party of characters that journey together to stop some big evil threat attacking the world. Conceptually, think something akin to Baldur's Gate or the classic D&D campaign, at least in terms of character progression and party dynamics. The world itself is rather lackluster. There aren't any factions or kingdoms that you can interact with. Society as a whole seems to be some kind of conglomeration of independent villages with no real cohesion or central force governing them. Basically, don't expect any real world building from the title. I don't want you to get the wrong idea though. Waldermyth doesn't need to supply any of this to achieve the goal it attempts. The primary focus of the title is on the party, how they are as individuals, as well as the relationship between each other. Frankly, even the plots of each campaign and these large threats aren't all that engaging. It may be unoriginal to say, but it's the journey that really counts here. You see, the myth-making aspect is not about fighting some threat to human civilization, although that certainly helps push things along. It's the characters you end up creating, and and their individual stories that makes this title what it is. Every campaign begins with a cast of three characters that you have to design. It's here that the legends of these individuals begin. With that being said, the overall character designer is pretty weak. There are only a handful of faces, hairstyles, and head shapes you can choose from, and while this may not seem all that important to some people, I think it's fundamental to any character creator. We all love to say we don't judge a book by its cover, but let's be real, it's ingrained in us to do so. When creating another being, their appearance speaks to their personality. After all, what you wear can often betray your values and experiences. It's a form of expression. Now, I'm not saying I'm gonna know everything about a person based on their t-shirt and shorts, but let's not pretend that there isn't some kind of info to be gained. The same argument applies to fantasy people as well. The clothing, hairstyle, color scheme, and look on their face are all an expression of who that character is. When you're trying to provide an experience that focuses on the individual stories of a whole cast of people, the options available to designing them should be vast. This isn't the case in Wildermyth, and I believe that damages the initial experience. There also aren't any of the typical variety options used to give a character some more pizzazz. What I'm talking about are races or backstories that give each character unique modifiers based on what you chose. Actually, that last part isn't true, but the way Waldermyth handles a character's past is hit and miss. Whenever recruiting a new party member or starting a campaign, each person generated has a little blurb detailing some important events associated with their youth. This is accompanied by some stat increases that are completely random. Now to give the title some credit, you can edit the pre-generated backstory and write in whatever you want. I think this is a neat little addition, but is ultimately ineffective for reasons I'll get to shortly. What I think is an egregious sin is that you can't do the same for the upbringing modifiers each character has. Instead, if you want to get anything useful or specific to the personality of the person you're creating, you have to keep randomizing until you get something acceptable, which can get pretty frustrating when you get one or two things you like, but the others contradict the character you're trying to create. So that was fairly negative, which doesn't really mesh well with me saying the best part of the title is the characters you play as. I'll admit the initial character creator could use some additions, but surprisingly, it's not as fundamental to the title as you may initially believe. 
That's because Wildermyth adopts a go-with-the-flow style of character development. It's okay to not put a whole lot of effort into creating your initial cast or any of the party. In fact, I would argue that Wildermyth performs at its best when you don't create a type of backstory for a member of the crew. The philosophy behind this goes something like this. Generic blank slates with little personality outside the bare minimum can be difficult to get invested in, however there is another side to this. When something is empty, its contents can be vast. This unlimited potential is the strength of Wildermyth. Knowing this, it's much easier to understand why procedurally generated events were the route taken. Since the party is heavily malleable, the randomness of them helps fill the void of their personalities. Neither you nor the game itself knows what lies in store for these people, and it's this that allows for true individuality to take form. This is why writing in your backstory isn't as strong as it may seem. There's no guarantee the story you come up with will fit the interactions and events that happen to that character, potentially ruining part of the greatest appeal Wildermyth has to offer. It isn't wise to create a long, in-depth backstory for a character, and it's better to instead play it safe with something vague. This does limit some of your own creative freedom, but yet again, I don't think this is a bad thing. One of the immediate gains from this is it incentivizes the use of the pre-generated bios, which there are a plethora of, to make starting a campaign quick and easy. Some people aren't looking to write their own stories and simply want to get things moving. The real strength is players who don't want to write a large backstory have that option, while individuals that want to get into the details are allowed to do so. They may not be able to have the depth that they want, but over the course of a campaign, every member of the party gets a chance to shine and grow through the player's imagination. With that point out of the way, there are some ways you can influence how a character may act. Each member of the crew has personality stats that affect what kind of events will happen or what they'll say during a conversation. You can edit these as much as you like, giving the player the ability to influence the relationships and characters in a party. What this allows for is some kind of cohesion within the randomness. Characters will generally behave according to these stats, so the potential problem of your party members acting like completely different people is addressed appropriately. I would argue Wildermyth gives you just enough control so the player can attempt to diversify the experience between various campaigns, but ultimately takes most of the power away from you in order to simulate a gradual growth that builds alongside the player's imagination. To translate that, as these interactions between characters and moments happen, you start to develop a headcanon in your own mind. Havloth, my Star Touch mystic, was generally regarded as the crazy guy everyone agreed to just ignore whenever he went on one of his ramblings. Of course, he somehow ended up getting the attractive green-haired warrior with nature energy legs who teleported from another timeline to fall in love with him. Now that I think about it, these two were probably made for one another. It's this kind of wacky absurdity that makes the stories told in Wildermyth so entertaining, with all-around quality writing that leans on the comical side, but isn't afraid to embrace a more serious tone, at times creating introspective moments like whether or not higher beings or superstition actually exist, or having a member of your party come across a doppelganger of themselves. This can conclude with you choosing to have the two selves fight to the death where it's unclear which side was the victor, leaving the player wondering what occurred, whether they're playing the original version, or even which version was the real one to begin with. Perhaps you were controlling the doppelganger all along. This strength of writing extends to the group dynamics as well, which the title puts a strong emphasis on. It's not just the development of each individual character, but how they interact with others that really brings out the experience. This is helped by the friend-rival-lover system. Most members of your party will just be companions to each other, but sometimes they can fall in love, or even grow to dislike each other. Although this rivalry is always on the friendlier side of the spectrum, you're not going to suddenly have one of your characters murdering the other in cold blood. An example of this is one member of the crew asking another if they've ever loved anyone. This conversation gets cut short for a completely different moment, but later in another event, this minor conversation is brought up again, where the two can become lovers. A rival warrior and mystic can poke fun at each other with the frontline hitter ribbing on the mage for communicating with furniture while they take on foes directly. This extends to parent and child where the two will have unique dialogue or even moments with each other because of their familial bond. Eventually, much like the characters themselves, you start to develop a headcanon in your own mind about the inner world workings of the party. These past events create interactions that allow the player to immerse themselves in the group. Party members will have a lot of history with each other, and due to this you start to associate certain members with each other. A warrior may save another member from being viciously assaulted by some vines, or a cook may magically create an amazing meal that raises the party's spirits out of just onions. The player uses these as a launching pad to develop their own version of the party that is then supplemented by future events that they can factor into their own headcanon to further expand upon it. With all the story and character development mumbo-jumbo out of the way, the question still remains, how do you play this game? 
I mean, the natural character progression is cool and all, but if the game isn't fun to play or its mechanics aren't properly developed, then who cares? Alright, so Watermyth takes place on a grid-like overworld where your party travels from space to space. A campaign is divided into three or five chapters, with the world expanding once a chapter is completed. Parties traverse the world, scouting out unexplored areas which typically result in the player having to fight a wave of enemies to clear the area. This is also where the events I've been talking about so much occur. Every time you scout an unexplored part of the world, a random event will trigger utilizing the members of the group who perform the task. These can relate to the fights themselves, giving you benefits or penalties depending on the outcome of decisions you make, but can just as easily be about something else unrelated. Breaking away from the discussion on character growth, let's focus on the gameplay itself. Each battle takes place on a grid-like map with up to five party members per encounter. Turns are divided into two phases, with each unit having two actions. The title immediately gives the player a heavy advantage. The speed stat only affects how many tiles a character can move per action point, not turn order because the player's party automatically gets to go first every time. This design decision is fundamental to the gameplay of Waldermyth. Creating a Blitzkrieg style of play where the goal of every turn is to kill as many enemies as possible alongside positioning your party in a way so that the enemy can't respond during their own turn. Admittedly, this is the ideal goal of every turn-based tactical RPG, but the key word there is ideal. This isn't always achievable, and oftentimes these titles are designed so the player trades blows between the enemy, with the more realistic standard of attempting to weaken the potential damage the enemy can cause you not outright stopping it. In a game where turn order is based on the unit's individual speed, the player is forced to make decisions based around this. They may have to sacrifice an ideal play because the turn order would lead to damage or consequences to their characters that aren't worth the payoff. Instead, you have to play around with the hand you are dealt. You don't make decisions based purely on your current circumstances, but consider the long game. One enemy may not have as much damaging potential as another, but their location in the order causes them to obstruct your plays. Sacrificing a maneuver that may give a high return in the initial moment for something more beneficial in the long game. In general, this not only gives the developers more tools to create combat encounters, but makes them feel more distinct. The circumstances of every encounter are typically different from one another that the player is kept entertained, feels a sense of challenge, and gives them room to experiment with new strategies. After all, necessity is the mother of innovation, if the game doesn't provide unique challenges, there's very little incentive to change up a winning strategy. Personally, I believe a good game forces the player to experiment with the options given to them, while a lesser title can provide those options but will give no incentive to do so. Another advantage of a turn order based system is making trading attacks a fundamental aspect of play. This allows for a higher variety of situations and in general makes gameplay more malleable. For instance, in Wilder Myth, where the goal is to obliterate your enemies so that they can barely mount an offense of their own, enemy debuffs don't play a large role, which is odd considering there are quite a few in the game. The player can utilize these to great effect, but the AI hardly ever has the opportunity to do so. That's because the game relies on the player being able to either stop all forms of attack or severely limit the offense the AI does get in. It is true that you have to play around the capabilities of each foe, but since you can unload all of your offense at once, it's a simple task to focus on the largest threats, allowing the pawns on the chessboard to survive because their threat level is low, but removing the real obstacles to survival before they get the opportunity to achieve anything. Since these opponents never get the chance to actually do anything, the player only ever has to play around their potential threat rather than the newly crafted set of circumstances based off the offense they do get in. The real problem with Waldermyth's two-phase cycle is the player is given dominant control over the flow of combat rather than it being shared between both parties, which as I've laid out, leads to less compelling encounters. With that being said, there is a question that has to be asked. What if the player doesn't have the ability to dispose of these threats? What if you make a bad move? Well, if you fail to utilize your overwhelming advantage, then the AI will gladly take it from you. They now get to attack you all at once, and the outcome certainly isn't pretty. Character's health reaching zero is a very real possibility. To ensure that this is a major consequence, Watermyth has a party members to feed have lasting effects throughout the rest of the campaign. The most damaging damaging outcome is the character pulling an Aerith for the rest of the game. You invested so much time into them, and now they're gone forever. However, there are some other options that aren't quite as lethal, but still pack a punch. Some examples are the loss of a limb which damages overall character utility, or having permanent debuffs such as lower speed or max health.
health. These tend to have the effect the developers were most likely trying to achieve. They feel impactful and effectively reinforce the Blitzkrieg style by giving real consequences to mistakes. Even positioning, something crucial to most turn-based RPGs, is not handled well. There are no damage modifiers based on the mechanics such as back attacks. The best alternative is something called flanking where an ally gets a guaranteed hit against a foe if they attack an enemy another party member already assaulted from another direction. Getting a guaranteed blow isn't exactly a massive incentive when the hit rate is often in at least the 80s, with the only exception being the dagger dealing double damage when flanking. This means that only one weapon can really utilize the mechanic in any meaningful way. There's also walling, which is a buff granted when two characters stand adjacent to one another. This causes them to take one less damage, and additional blocking that changes in value based on the strength of their relationship. In case you don't know, blocking is the chance to completely nullify an enemy's attack. Admittedly, there's no reason to not wall if the action is available, but one less damage isn't anything game-breaking, and while the extra blocking is nice, it's ultimately unreliable. Essentially, players should wall if it's convenient, but the advantages aren't powerful enough to warrant it being a factor in their decision-making. Since this is the case, it does very little to add any spark to positioning. These two examples are the only real spice the title adds to positioning outside of the basic gauging enemy movement and ensuring you're just outside their range. So I've spent a lot of time on what could be perceived as bashing Waldermyth's combat, although that wasn't my goal. In a vacuum where I don't consider any of Waldermyth's other mechanics, many of these flaws run rampant. However, everything I've said so far doesn't give an accurate image of the whole picture. Some of these systemic flaws are accurate, such as positioning, but the same cannot be said about the part you play as, or variety in combat. Neither of these are as poorly executed as I've made them out to be. The main contributing factor for this, much like with the appeal of the narrative, is the ability to customize your party members. In Wildermyth, there are three classes, Warrior, Hunter, and Mystic. All three of these play like their names would suggest. Warriors focus on up-close melee combat, dealing large amounts of damage and acting as a target for foes that manage to survive the turn. Hunters are typically ranged-based, although they can easily mix it up on the front lines, usually focusing less on pure damage and more on utility options such as applying debuffs through traps, although their melee dagger combo allows them to have the highest potential damage out of any class. Mystics are easily the most unique thing Waldermyth has going for it. Typically, mages have their spells limited through an MP system or allowing for a certain amount of uses per encounter. Watermyth employs a hybrid version of the latter. You see the Mystic class interfuses with the objects scattered around the map and performs attacks based on what they bonded with. This can shred enemy armor, apply status effects such as hobble, or even buff themselves or allies. Basically, Mystics are entirely reliant on the environment of the map you're loaded into and enemies positioning relative to the objects a Mystic can interfuse with. This may seem highly limiting and inconvenient, causing Mystics to be weaker compared to their counterparts who always have the same utility no matter the circumstances of the area. Shockingly, this isn't the case. Or at least, it isn't common. Environments are often designed so that the class always has the ability to perform a decent to even good move. I would even argue the class has the most initial complexity. Making the utility of the Mystic based somewhat on randomness provides substance to each encounter they partake in. Since the environment of levels often differ, the player has to make do with the options given to them, meaning they have to formulate a strategy based on whatever is lying around, rather than a set of skills they have access to. Now I'm not arguing the latter is a bad thing, just that the Mystic provides a unique spin, forcing a different kind of thought process than what is typically used in a character build. The trade-off to this is the Mystic class customization is far less impactful than the Warrior or Hunter. The typical bonuses are enhancing the effects of a set of environments you can interfuse with. An example is Earth Scribe, granting the party member one additional armor and HP when interfused with rock-based objects. The problem here is, you don't know what you're going to interfuse with during any encounter. You may not interfuse with any of the objects the character gets those benefits from, making the upgrade fairly useless. Luckily, these enhanced versions of attacks aren't necessary to keep Mystics relevant, however they don't allow for the main purpose of these upgrades to be achieved, to make a character play in a unique way. Instead, most Mystics feel exactly the same. Going back, I said they had the most initial complexity, and that statement holds true, but as the game goes on, they start to fall off. There typically isn't much of a difference between two different Mystic characters, with them instead being highly reliant on the randomness of a level to achieve any amount of variety in play. So there's a bit of a trade-off here. Long-term customization is sacrificed for short-term uniqueness. Initially, the amount of options this class has available seems vast, however once you grow accustomed to using the class, every Mystic begins to feel the same across all campaigns. 
which greatly damages the experience since there are only two other classes. Initially, I didn't want to spend all that much time on one specific class, but sometimes when I write these scripts, my hands get a mind of their own, and I just start typing away. Maybe that's why I have a bad habit of never shutting up. I mean, have you seen the length of some of these videos? My god. <clears throat> Anyway, I do think the Mystic class deserve the time I devoted to them, as they do play fairly differently from the other classes found in this genre of game. I won't be dedicating the same amount of time to the other classes because I don't think it's really necessary. What I do want to return to is the idea of character customization. You know, the thing I was supposed to be talking about. With the basics of classes out of the way, and the introduction of upgrades, I think it's a good time to expand upon that subject. Typical to most games, defeating encounters grants experience that lead to level ups. This is accompanied by some stat increases, but that's not what matters here. The real jewel, if you will, is the random set of four skills the player can choose from. This is the biggest feather in Wilderness Cap when it comes to character building. Randomization is yet again utilized for an understandable reason that has some initial benefits, but ultimately hurts the title all more. I won't be getting into that negative right now, as I want to go over the positive elements. Sticking with that goal, gimping the player by limiting what options they get to put on a character forces them to experiment. Remember what I said earlier, titles with more complex gameplay mechanics always benefit when they require the player to experiment. You know, push them out of their comfort zone. A lot of people might find this to be annoying. I mean, no one really likes to be out of their comfort zone, especially min-maxers who want the best possible build they can make. But this is fundamental to the enjoyment of Waldermyth. In the beginning, I focused a lot on the characters and how they develop their own personalities and relationships over time. This is seamlessly integrated into gameplay as well, and helps further expand upon this core concept. It's not rocket science that randomized upgrades lead to diverse builds. Just look at roguelikes where this is practically gospel. They have you repeating the same loop over and over again, fighting the same enemies and running through the same areas. It's the combination of random upgrades, skills, weapons, the list goes on, that makes the experience these titles offer enjoyable for long periods of time, despite the fact that they don't even attempt to mask that the player is endlessly looping through the same gameplay sections. Waldermyth is a lot like this. Going through doors in Hades can lead to upgrades from the various gods. The skills you pick up when leveling up behave in the exact same way. You don't get a skill tree, you're at the mercy of the game. So yet again, you're forced to experiment and take risks. You'll learn how certain skills work in tandem with one another, and find some combinations that you may not have initially thought would be effective. Being allowed to choose your builds every time relies on the player to explore themselves. For some inexplicable reason, I spend my free time making long-form critiques that overanalyze video games that nobody watches to the end. It's a requirement for me to attempt to break the game in any way I can. Most people are not as insane as me. They'll pick what they're comfortable with, and most likely not stray from the path too much. To go even further, these skills combine with specific weapon types to lead to even more diverse builds. Each weapon has something unique about them. The mace knocks enemies back when you attack them. This little detail can be used to great effect. For instance, the warrior has a skill that allows them to end their turn with an attack prepared. If a foe steps into their attack range, they're gonna get smacked. This works exceptionally well with maces because of the knockback effect. The warrior's attack will interrupt the enemy's movement, forcing them to consume one of their two action points. They also won't be in attack range anymore, so now they've effectively wasted their turn because they only have one action left, and that will be wasted on moving. This is a pretty effective strategy. You get damage on the opponent's turn, and they waste that turn accomplishing nothing. It's win-win, or I guess, lose-lose for the enemy. To further build upon this, the title introduces something called transformations. These are exactly what they sound like, and yet again are based purely on chance. A party member can get a random event where they bond with an ancient wolf spirit, become part flame, or meet some crow lady. What these do is contribute the exact same build diversity that these skills and weapons do. What happens is a character typically has some unique visual added to them, alongside their limbs altering based on the transformation received. Arms give the party member new attacks, and legs offer stat buffs. There is a bit of a trade-off here. When an arm is altered, that hand can no longer hold any equipment, so any two-handed weapon is thrown out the window. Replace both arms, and they can't wield any tool at all, completely reliant on the attack their transformation offers them. The events that give these don't tell you what the result is going to be, so you'll pick an option and get stuck with a character now having that transformation. This further allows for more build experimentation, and incentivizes the player 
player to do so because the transformation is forced onto them, yet again making the player at least attempt to integrate the new options at their disposal into their strategy or develop an entirely new approach. Waldermyth is very successful at building characters that players bond with not just through its narrative, but also through gameplay. Every character in a party feels unique and is fun to play. Even the mystics can benefit from transformations or experimenting with different types of weapons. This is also true from a visual stance. In the beginning, I actually criticized Waldermyth because of its lack of character depth when it came to visuals. However, that was only true for character creation. Throughout the campaign, you will be acquiring various pieces of armor that add stat increases. Factor this in with transformations, and each character will have their own unique style going for them. So to summarize, party members all have their own personalities and relationships that players can get invested in, play differently from each other, and all have distinct looks. Sounds like a recipe for success to me. And it is! I said Waldermit's greatest advantage was its characters, and I wasn't lying. A lot of this can be attributed to the random factor the game employs in just about everything. This design decision makes a great deal of sense and is utilized effectively. Well, okay. That isn't entirely true. You see, contrary to what I've been saying, everything isn't sunshine and rainbows. Initially, the title does have a great deal of success with its randomization, however, this doesn't last forever. The biggest drawback of this decision is it relies on having enough content to feed the beast with the animal being creating distinct characters through outfits, builds, and identities. Sadly, after a while, things start to repeat. You get the same transformations, different campaigns will have the same events repeating, and the different lines of dialogue aren't enough to spice them up, and there aren't enough skills to stop the player from creating similar builds even in the same campaign. This isn't as bad from a narrative perspective. Character personalities and relationships don't just blur together into a forgettable mass of existences. However, the events that lead to the evolution of your party members will lose their luster over time. On the other hand, how they play gets dull faster than I would like. Many of your characters will have unique personalities and relationships, but when it comes to combat encounters, things start to get a little forgettable. It isn't uncommon for randomness to backfire and cause a character to receive no skills that correlate well together, leading to a playstyle that doesn't have a particular focus. The character may be useful in combat, since the combination of stat increases from level ups and gear upgrades are enough to make a character useful, but since their skills don't flow well together, they're just smacking enemies around with no strategy or cohesion, which isn't mechanically interesting, nor diversifies the character's playstyle. Even the combinations that do exist aren't high in quantity. Warriors tend to have a tank-like build where they take aggro while boosting armor to insane levels, or they have an offensive approach where defeating a foe leads to an automatic dodge of the next attack. This combos well with a skill that has the party member counterattacking whenever they dodge an attack, allowing for repeats of the same move as long as they are capable of one-shotting a foe. However, there aren't that many other combinations that add this level of synchronization, leading to the plain smacking around problem I just mentioned. It doesn't help that many transformations don't combine well with skills and usually are more detrimental than beneficial. I often found myself not wanting my character to transform because it directly damaged my build or added nothing to it. The experimentation of transformations is only really effective in the beginning. Once a character has leveled up a few times, they either have a strategy, which typically transformations don't aid, or if there is nothing cohesive yet, they become the strategy. You build around the attacks the transformations offer and forget about weapons or even a lot of the skills because they aren't relevant. This isn't always the case, as long reach, which gives additional attack range, can be really useful in combination with these, but you could also say this about any attack. What I'm trying to say is, something like Long Reach is a jack-of-all-trades skill. Extra attack range is useful in just about any build, so it doesn't mean as much. Transformations are usually great when you have an entire build focused around them, but are lackluster or hardly even used when that isn't the case because they don't connect well with the classes themselves. The only exception to this is Mystics because their skill upgrades are far less vital to their effectiveness. The final topic I want to discuss is difficulty levels. This isn't something I typically talk about on this channel, but it's fundamental to Wildermyth's experience. With each battle, the type of monster fought gains new modifiers, abilities, or even access to new foes to join its ranks. These are called calamities. Something I failed to mention is that traveling from tile to tile costs in-game time to go by. Over time, this leads to an event where multiple calamity cards are drawn, and the player is given the opportunity to stop some of them from occurring through legacy points. 
these aren't that important for my final point. All you need to know is that they're generally gained by completing combat encounters. All this facilitates a gradual growth in enemy strength that is meant to scale with you, ensuring that combat encounters never grow stale by upping the difficulty and adding in new enemies to fight. Seems pretty reasonable and effective, right? Well, in theory, yes, but in practice... Uh... The Calamity card game has a pretty big flaw. Every campaign has a primary enemy that you face off against, which means 90% of the encounters will be against them. This is necessary to ensure they maintain strength relative to your party. The problem is when time goes by and you're forced to pick your poison, it turns out someone switched it out for some bitter tea instead. All of the other monster types you aren't fighting frequently make up a substantial portion of the enemy buffs, meaning all you really need to do is get rid of one or two bonuses to the primary threat and then just move on completely defeating the point of these events to begin with. However, this is only a minor concern in comparison to my main gripe. Difficulty directly interferes with the best element of the game, the party building aspect. I'll admit difficulty is highly subjective, but I found the standard mode was a little too easy. Enemy strength didn't scale appropriately, and combat encounters while initially engaging grew stale over time. The problem definitely goes away if you play on the two higher difficulties, but another issue is created in its place. Instead of being at the whims of randomness and wanting your characters to develop organically, you spend a lot more time trying to min-max. This is done through time management as well as combat. Calamity events are far more impactful since the time period between them is cut down, meaning you have less legacy points to fend off the enemy bonuses. The other difficulty spike is the calamities themselves are far more devastating. You go from a 20% enemy health increase to 40%, which is massive! You're no longer spending your time focusing on the development of your characters, but instead on how to survive. The fun little battle narratives that develop through gameplay are gone as you desperately try to tread water whilst the title drowns you in opponents. The biggest draw of Waldermyth disappears. This is the problem with difficulty. It's either the title is too easy, which helps facilitate character growth since you don't have to focus too much on strong builds or time management, but then the combat encounters feel lackluster. On the other hand, combat is pretty well done on the higher difficulties, creating a real challenge for players even if they're experienced. Except the trade-off is, you can't afford to immerse yourself in the narratives of your party anymore, deeply damaging the main appeal of the title. When I look at Wilder Myth as a whole picture, I think the game is worth playing. It does a lot of things right, and provides a truly unique experience that most games don't offer. There's a lot of heart put into the game, and I respect the developers for creating the product that they did. It's difficult to juggle such a strong reliance on random encounters alongside creating characters that feel like people. Party dynamics and relationships are also done really well. Combat is also enjoyable despite my complaints. I especially like how combat encounters can contribute to the stories and headcanons the game and players weave together. It feels like you're developing a story alongside the devs, not just them laying out a narrative for you to experience. Looking back at my large cast that developed over time, I remember the fond moments and memories each of them had. That's a powerful thing. Something special that the player can cherish. So despite all the criticisms and flaws, I really do like Wilder Myth. I have a lot of those memories, and I won't be forgetting them anytime soon. As always, I wanted to thank you for watching the video. Compared to my more recent projects, this one was rather short, especially for the amount of time it took me to produce. I guess I wanted to apologize for that. These videos are greatly time-consuming, and I got a little burnt out, not really doing any channel work consistently for a substantial period of time. I want you to know that I'm doing better now, and taking over a month to release a 30-minute video won't be happening again. The next project will definitely be longer, and hopefully won't take as long as this video to release. Although how long, I can't really say, considering I think something will be an hour, and then it ends up being double that or more. Looking at you, Ghost of Tsushima! Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again.